I'm excited to share that changes are coming on FemPower Health. To be updated on what those might be, subscribe to the podcast, and you can go to the show notes to follow me on social media, as well as subscribe to the weekly newsletter. And I promise you, no spam with the newsletters. They're always very purposeful because I am cognizant of your time and your very, very busy inbox. So stay tuned. Can't wait to share what's coming. The action going on in the ovary just struck me as so much more dynamic and violent than anything that I had been taught. I was shocked that we'd all heard the journey of the courageous sperm swimming to the egg, but we never heard what the egg endured to get to that point. Welcome to FemPower Health, Georgie here. Today we're venturing into a space where science meets history and society, the evolving understanding of female anatomy. We're honored to have with us Rachel Gross, an award-winning science journalist from Brooklyn. Rachel's pen has graced the pages of renowned publications such as the New York Times, The Atlantic, National Geographic, Wired, and so many more, with a keen eye for capturing the debate and personalities that mold scientific knowledge, Rachel has given voice to narratives that both intrigue and educate. Her latest book, Vagina Obscura, An Anatomical Voyage, is a fascinating journey into the world of early anatomists and their mapping of female anatomy. It not only delves into the historical nuances, but also touches upon the empowering stories of a modern generation that's reclaiming these narratives. It's a conversation we've been eager to have. If you're interested and curious about the intersections of history, science, and society, you are in for a real treat. Now let's embark on this anatomical voyage together. So Rachel, tell us about yourself because you have done such incredible work in women's health. And so let this audience get to know you better. So, so tell us what you do and why you wrote this book. Well, thank you so much, Georgie. That, that means so much that you read it so thoughtfully um, and have looked at my work. Um, yeah, so nowadays I'm a reproductive sexual health reporter. Um, I've been a general science reporter for more than a decade, but I really just found that I am super passionate about bodies and writing about gender bias and writing about the relationships between patients and doctors um, and why we know so little about the female body. Um, so yeah, as you're mentioning, that all started with my book, Vagina Obscura, um, which I started like almost five years ago now, which is Whoa. crazy. Um, okay. It took me like three years to write, part of which was the pandemic. But since then, yeah, I've been all vaginas all the time. Um, <laughs> and as I as I start in the book, it it did sort of solidify from this medical mystery experience that I had where I learned that neither I nor my doctor knew how to treat vaginal problems that one third of women and people with vulvas have and instead they only had an option for me that they literally said was rat poison that I had to put in my vagina and that was both horrific and really eye-opening to me about why women's health is so behind in so many ways, both about what we know about the female body and the reproductive system and how much we care about and treat these super common conditions that most all of us will have at some point in our lives. Yep. No, absolutely. And, you know, you, I love the way you wrote the book. So each chapter is about different aspects of women's bodies. And I love that you end with the trans population. It was like such a perfect journey in reading the book. Like it was so perfectly written. So first, and you've iterated this already, but I just have to, to share this. The beliefs we share as a society about sex and gender harm all bodies. Culture and medicine shape bodies. So I think that is like a serious summary of a lot of what mm -hmm. you said. So. Before we dive into the book, I thought we would take a note from Dr. Brennan and how she starts her lectures. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. Dr. Patty Brennan, our vagina yes. and penis extraordinaire. Okay, so we're going to say it together. Vagina, vagina, vagina. Vagina, vagina, vagina. Clitoris, clitoris, clitoris. Clitoris, clitoris, 
clitoris. All right. Now that we've warmed up the audience, mm -hmm. I think that's such a fun way to start her class. Um, mm -hmm. And it's honestly much more common that we're using this terminology, but I still find a lot of people are uncomfortable with it. So a quote you also said it that, you know, really honed in on why you wrote this book. You're just like, it hit me. I almost knew nothing about how my vagina worked. That was the moment this book was born. I'm working on a piece on menstrual blood diagnostics right now. And I'm just like blown away. Like, I mean, it's so obvious, but like this is your uterine lining telling you what it's been doing all month and it changes day by day. You'll have more uterine lining one day, more like venous blood the next. It's it's so cool and it's just, I mean, it's not that complicated, I guess is my point. It's sort of intuitive, but we're not right. taught to seek that information. Exactly. And I've actually heard that in this, when I interviewed um, uh, Dr. Lori Mintz, who's the author of Becoming Clitorate, she was saying like, those who grew up as adults in the 70s, so I was born in the 70s, but those who were adults are like, oh my God, we totally understand all the stuff about our bodies. I mean, maybe not all the technical stuff, but at least for, from certain aspects, they totally know it and are like, how come no one else does? And so it was like after that, that everything shifted to now the next generation having not a clue. Yeah, that was something really interesting and disturbing to me is that sometimes I'll get women that were from the era of our bodies ourselves at talks and they will sort of be laughing like wow we already did all this work and they're right like we are having to kind of ingrain that curiosity and body empowerment in another generation but i don't know maybe this is how patriarchy works like we we almost have to work harder at retaining what we've learned generationally rather than reinventing the wheel every generation yeah. Now you were mentioning how one third of women suffer from bacterial vaginosis and you mm -hmm. shared a story of someone that was going into a study. And this is just um, flipping back to what you were discussing about how you ended up coming to mm -hmm. writing this book. And I do want to share some of these histories and these concrete examples, because what I'm imagining is as people listen to this episode, they're going to say, oh, I identify with that. Because um, I do think history really does help inform, and I, I hear so many people talking about medical gaslighting. It's like the hashtag now on Instagram, oh, right? That is really interesting. I think it's made this experience much more visible, and, and like being able to name anything, kind of like manspreading. Like once we had a name for it, you could identify it, or sexual harassment in the workplace. That's but right. But it is obviously being kind of overused and generalized. Exactly. So Victoria Field, she um, talked to you about turning off her GPS location on her phone when she drove for her from her home to Ithaca or in Ithaca to Boston because she didn't want anyone to know she was in a clinical trial for a vagina problem. Like this is the shame that mm -hmm. we women are facing. So tell us about this trial and, and the work that women have been well, mostly female doctors have been doing to help women struggling and some of the surprises that, that you came across that even helped you with like, oh my goodness, if only I knew this, I probably would have handled my situation differently if I could have been more informed to talk about it. So, so tell us about that experience. Yeah, this one was, um, was a case of my experience kind of leading me down a rabbit hole and realizing that a lot of people were struggling with this. Um, so yeah, when I mentioned the common infection and the the boric acid, um, that was for bacterial vaginosis, it affects one in three women and can be, it's very often recurrent where it's really hard to get rid of and there's really no good answer. So um, I found this scientist, Dr. Carolyn Mitchell, who is basically doing the equivalent of fecal transplants, but with vaginal transplants. So vaginal fluid, um, you can change your own vaginal ecosystem or microbiome by bringing in like a healthy, good ecosystem. Um, and it makes a lot more sense than the current treatments like antibiotics um, or boric acid, which just like kill the entire ecosystem, like, a, like they're the nuclear option and they don't guarantee that good stuff's gonna grow back. So she was um, recruiting for this trial when I was writing the book, she actually got delayed because of the pandemic. But so I was able to talk with a couple people that were trying to get into it. And yeah, it was really remarkable how desperate a lot of them were to be part of something like this for both the hope of a solution to a problem that had been like plaguing them and their relationships for years and to be part of science moving forward for like everyone else dealing with this. You know, I, I talked to people with endometriosis and fibroids as well, 
Um, but this one had a lot of cultural shame that was really profound to me. It was something that was so intimate and also so dismissed by larger society. Um, it was, it was that intersection of like taboo and gross and also considered unimportant by most of medicine. And that's what made it such a hard journey for them, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. Have you kept in touch um, with the latest on how things are coming along with that research and being able to use this for the vaginal microbiome? Because I've done, the interviews I've done have been much more around just, you know, talking about the products you should or shouldn't use because the vaginal microbiome is so important. Yeah, no, this one I'm still fascinated by. Yeah, so I believe that Dr. Mitchell's finishing her trial now, um, and there might even be other trials at this point. Um, I know in the book I reported on, there was a promising but very small trial in Israel. So it looks like promising results are coming out, um, and it's that there still would be a long time probably to a commercial product, but there might be more opportunities for people to get these transplants um, at like hospitals if they qualify. The other promising thing is, right, I have also written about the vaginal pri probiotics on the market and the fact that the oral type that you swallow are not likely to work because they have to go through your whole gut. But in yep. this country, we really don't have actual vaginal suppositories available because of FDA stuff. So there are groups working on the first true vaginal probiotics, which are way more promising. And I actually believe um, hold a lot of potential. It's just unfortunate because until now, and I'm sure you're super aware of this, um, that market has been a lot of like shady or just companies without a lot of data promising. Right. A lot. So it would be great to get some like FDA approved stuff out there. It's great to have diagnostics, but you need the treatment. And if you have the treatment, hopefully it's a good one and you have diagnostics for it. So that is, ex yeah, I've been thinking about that actually a lot lately because um, I've been following companies trying to get an endometriosis diagnostic that doesn't require surgery. Yep. And it's so promising because like, as you know, there's like a seven to 10 year wait time for most people to get a diagnosis. But I, I also have that same question. I'm like, if it, like that could be so distressing to find out you have it and don't have any good options for you because there's not that many. Um, so we need to fix so many parts of the broken pipeline, I guess. Oh yeah, it's, it's crazy. And it's interesting because in pharma, they have companion diagnostics so that you have to die for cancer especially. So, you know, you have to make sure you get the right treatment so they have diagnostics so that they can better understand what your treatment should be. So it'd be so great if we get to that kind of system. Yeah, I think that is the goal of these diagnostics is that they can also with endo specifically, um, since it's thought that it's like many different types of, of disease like cancer, that you would be able to identify which one would be more responsive to which treatment, similar to how we treat breast cancer, but that is in the future. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, probably distant future. So in chapter one, um, I had highlighted a, a quote and um, I had a question for you on your thought about this. So in chapter one, you talk about the desire or the glands clitoris. And there's a, it's a footnote actually. In 1920s yeah. America, a woman failing to orgasm during sex with her husband was legal grounds for divorce. And you know what I thought when I read that? Is this why women fake? I don't think it's the root of it, but I think it's definitely related. I mean, it's all cultural pressure, right? It's that it's what do you, what do you expect your body to do during a sexual experience? What are you told that it should be doing? And what are you told will please or placate your partner? And there's a, there's a lot of reasons to fake, unfortunately, which is big can of worms. <laughs> Okay, so now on to the internal clitoris, um, the chapter two entitled Wholeness. So this is, so there were some really funny ones. One was Dr. Brennan and the birds. Mm -hmm. So she analyzed the vagina of 16 species of waterfowl and found remarkable diversity compared to um, what we knew of any other bird group. It um, appeared that the way their, I guess their vagina was, that it made the male's job harder mm -hmm. to be able to inseminate. 
because of that, it prevented the males from fully entering without female cooperation. And so I, when I read that, I'm like, is this like the equivalent of female dryness where our body is like dry? Cause it's like, don't do it. No, you cannot. I'm, I don't feel good yet. <laughs> oh my God. Interesting. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah. It was kind of fascinating because basically the duck's body is, um, the vagina is spiraling the opposite direction as the penis is spiraling because ducks, as you may know, um, male ducks have horrifying long coiled penises. Um, but it did seem like this was a way of controlling the reproductive outcome. Um, and there's many other aspects of duck reproductive biology that speak to this. There's like um, little cul-de-sacs and dead ends where sperm go to die in there. and it's possible that like tensing her muscles can affect um, what the penis is doing. So we obviously just can't say anything about the duck's consciousness and the idea of consent that is uh, beyond the scope of science. But, um, <laughs> but no, I hear you. Like, yeah, many people love to talk about duck feminism and how this is like ducks having bodily autonomy yes, we should listen to our vaginas not being interested in being penetrated. Absolutely. And if we do want to be penetrated and our bodies aren't cooperating, we should use lube. So that's right. We have choices that ducks do not. That's my point. There you go. That's true. But it was just, it was, this is the one that was just the funniest to me, but you did talk so much about all the research that um, people are doing and how they're leveraging animals. And this one just really, really stood out because she didn't even think that it was a big deal what she was doing. And then someone had actually asked her if some of the research I guess she was doing was getting turned down because it was a little bit offensive. And she's like, what do you mean? I totally like, I'm just doing research. Like I didn't like purposely go out to like talk about this. And so yeah. she kind of developed an interesting um, reputation. I really love that. I mean, something I noticed about all of these researchers, most of whom are women, was that they are a little bit shameless, that they do not have the same hesitancy as so many of us do. And that's what allowed them to pursue this in the first place and to think that they could when it was considered totally inappropriate or like out there to others. And eventually she made it mainstream. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, anything else that you want to share about um, the the clitoris um, that we have not discussed yet? Because if not, then we'll move on to the egg cell. Um, well, you may have heard that recently we debunked the myth that the clitoris has 8,000 nerves. Um, that had been spread around the internet a lot, and people loved, I mean, there's a classic tweet that's like, the clitoris has 8,000 nerve endings, but still isn't as sensitive as a white man on the internet. So we had to update that recently because a gender affirmation surgeon, a vulva specialist that I was talking to, they basically were like, hey, where did this number come from? Why is it always repeated? And why do we keep hearing it at gynecology conferences? And when they like pulled the threads, they found out it came from one study on cows in the 1970s. Um, and oh, nobody had bothered to confirm it. So they ended up doing that um, and finding it was 10,280, which like doesn't make a difference to our sensation and our experience of our clitoris, except it might make you feel powerful, which it should. But it just speaks to the fact that the female body wasn't kind of, nobody thought to explore this more rigorously um, for 50 years. I guess with all this, the interviewing that you've been doing and the wonderful publications um, that you've had in the New York Times and, and so many other areas in the podcast that you've done, you know, given that there are so many publications now, do you feel like there is becoming um, a greater transformation in people understanding their bodies? Or like, do you feel like we're moving the needle just a little because there's that much of a gap? Like, what are you sensing with the, the people you're collaborating with? I mean, I do have a lot of hope. Um, Besides the dark history, my book did focus a lot on people who are making a difference, like scientists and activists, and I absolutely see the same in um, reporters and book writers today. Two books this year, I think, uh, Womb by Leah Hazard and Period by Kate Clancy were both um, super smart, inclusive books about uteruses and what we know and 
don't know. So like I'm seeing a wave of information. I don't know that everyone is able to access it. You know, the, the really ironic thing is that it's happening at the time when reproductive rights are being curtailed and pushed back on. And I think that's actually driving a lot more interest and a lot more realization why it's really important to know this history, to know your body, to understand how to take care of yourself if you can't always rely on the medical system too. So some darkness and some hope. Um, there's also, I'm sure you've seen like a lot more writing about menopause um, and some more writing about sexual health, I would say. So yeah, from where I'm standing, and I obviously live in a particular bubble where I'm really attuned to this and always reading about it, um, I am seeing more. Um, there's also, there was a full length documentary on endometriosis and also a documentary um, on intersex rights this year, which both I thought were groundbreaking. You know, it, it's funny because I wonder that too about the education because I feel like I'm in a bubble too because I I'm um, actually just hit menopause. Um, yay! Congratulations! And um, thank you very much. I've spoken to so many of my friends because they're perimenopausal, a few po um, in postmenopause, and so many of them, actually almost all of them, don't know anything. Like I I was at a dinner party and yeah I was introduced as you know a podcast host and I talked about all the topics and like the party like ended and we just all started talking about all the symptoms and like not ended like the party itself but more everyone just stopped and that's what we talked about and so we had to kind of like okay everyone let's move on to other topics but they were so passionate about it yeah it speaks to a need that we need to express and talk about these things i was um i was talking to some folks on an irish podcast yesterday and one of them said that she has like a group where women will like pass around a candle and talk about like how they're they're experiencing their menopause when they're holding the candle and i thought that was really cool actually um that we just need i mean i guess it reminded me of like consciousness raising circles um but we need it to be more out in the open i think that's why it's good that menopause is having the moment and is more in the media but we also do need more research and more doctors to be informed oh, yeah. because most doctors aren't even trained on menopause care I guess just a quick plug on menopause, because I figure we might as well say it on every single episode, depending on who listens. So one, you need to know when you hit it, and here is why. So I just had my OBGYN appointment. I happened to, my menstrual cycle came back five months after I hit menopause. Funny enough, it was when I was hiking in Sedona, and the day I hiked the birthing cave, my what? period came back. <laughs> it just roared to life, it got the message. I, wow. I know. So I've, I've attributed it to um, relaxing and like finally not being stressed out, but my doctor attributed it to let's get a vaginal ultrasound and an endometrial biopsy to make sure you do not have endometrial cancer. And so this is why you have to know yeah. when you end menopause. Mm. So, you, so I told my doctor, I am menopausal, but I did get my period back. And she was like, you're coming in. So next week I do that. Um, and then I also asked her for vaginal estrogen per Dr. Rubin and Dr. Uloko. And she said, until we do this biopsy, we're not touching vaginal estrogen. And I know there's disagreement with doctors about how much is absorbed. And I did not want to have that debate on, mm. on that first day. Yeah. Um, so I'll continue to talk after. But yeah, it's the, like, so I feel so lucky because I yeah. interview all these experts. And so I know the questions to ask, what to bring up, how to share it. Right. And it made for a great appointment. Yeah, I've learned so much about menopause in the past few months that, yeah, I'm really grateful for because I don't know that I would have sought it out because it's just not something that you do until you're getting there and then it's like either too late or there's a lot to learn. Like one yeah. thing I learned recently was that there's so much confusion over perimenopause when like the hormone fluctuations are just really high um, and some people like think they can't get pregnant then. So it's actually a problem with people in perimenopause getting pregnant when they don't want to because they're yep. not given good information. So Miriam Minkins, oh my God. When I learned about her, I cried. Mm -hmm. I mean, posted on social media about it. I tell my friends about it. Yesterday I was with some folks and I told them, I'm like, fertility was is 50 years behind because her husband's job changed and because she, and so like awesome. literally, like that one thing <laughs> affected. <laughs> that is one like, way to look at it. I right? Love, I, love I mean, at least when I read the book, that's what I thought. And I was just like, just because her husband couldn't keep his job. Seriously. Yeah, and if she yeah. was born today. Yeah. Or, so, I mean, yeah, she faced so many challenges that uh, 
She was a brilliant scientist who was definitely overlooked and whose life was just careened on a different course because of circumstances outside her control. But she was the mother of IVF. Yep, she was a badass. So because you were doing the research, I'm not even going to summarize it. I want you to do it. And I want to hear what it was like to see that embryo at the library. That was so cool. Oh, yeah. So I spent a lot of time in um, the archives of the Harvard Center for the History of Medicine. And so they have like reams of Mary Minkin's papers, but nobody ever looks at them because she was she was the technical assistant to John Rock, the one of the developers of the birth control pill, and they have Rock's papers. So everyone goes straight for that and nobody looks at hers. Um, so <laughs> I had them all to myself and they were just like full of like poetry and personal notes and her really intricate lab notes and they were just so rich. Um, and yeah, basically she was on a track to become a physician She was a really brilliant biologist, but she ended up marrying someone who would become a scientist um, and becoming like his lab assistant um, and taking secretary school at the same time and not generally not being able to get into med school at the time because generally women weren't accepted. So all that eventually led her to the lab of John Rock and he was working on both, um, both helping women with fertility issues, mostly like blocked fallopian tubes, um, as well as contraception, which is really interesting. He was, he wanted women to be able to control their own bodies, um, and have safe pregnancies. He thought they were both like equally important. And he basically left Miriam Mankin alone to design all the protocols for getting an egg and a sperm together in a dish and to fuse. And she worked on it for years and years. Um, but she was the architect of that experiment. He never was in there. He was like delivering babies. And she finally did it. And well, the first one she actually lost, I believe. But one of the sec, the second or third one was the one I got to see at um, this medical library that was like on a military base. Um, and yeah, it's I mean, it's kind of unremarkable in some ways. It's like two cells engulfing each other, it looks like. Right. Um, it's kind of like a of two fried eggs together on a pan is how I described it. Um, but, (laughs) but just since I had the context of how incredible this was to the people doing the work and how they were like, you know, it's not quite life at that point, but they were like, Oh my God, this is the first step in creating life on a dish in allowing people to have babies who never had this option. Um, like who knows what the possibilities would be from here. And then right. hilariously, there were magazines speculating like, wow, I guess men won't be necessary anymore because we can just create life in a dish. And I was like, interesting uh, uh, conclusion there. It was really special and like an honor to be able to tell her story. Oh, yeah, it was amazing. And this was, um, and by the way, Miriam Minkin was in 1948 when they published the full version of their first IVF right, achievement. Right, but she did the... it, I think, in 44. Yes. So, like, during World War II, where it was kind of overshadowed and nobody noticed it. And, right, as you were saying, she never got a chance to follow up on that work and take it to the next steps, which was her her life dream to do. And right. so it was only in the 70s that we got the first IVF baby. There's a quote in here. It said, even if I had Liz Taylor's diamonds and I looked at them, I wouldn't think they were as glamorous as seeing this egg and the spermatozo- spermatozoa, right, yeah. whirling. <laughs> yeah, she was just so obsessed and such like a classic bench scientist. Um, it was just fascinating to try to understand her mind. Like she was enthralled and just, I think she, the fact that she was able to do this work was not lost on her because she worked so hard to get there. And it meant That's so awesome. much to her. Yeah. And and Dr. Rock, I mean, it's great. It sounds like he was a bit like forward thinking, you know, and mm-hmm. and why he was doing what he was doing. And it was just happenstance that Miriam was able to achieve what she did just the way she was researching it. And clearly she was very intelligent to look at things in a different way and, and create this path. So it's awesome. Are they looking to change like where her name is so that it's not so behind the scenes. Do you know if there's any sort of movement to do that? Interesting. Um, I was on a podcast where they, um, the people doing it went to the old, um, it's the free hospital for women where she worked and they were discussing the idea of getting like a plaque for her or some possibly like a monument. And that's something I I was really interested in. I don't know exactly how to start that process, but I 
I think she absolutely deserves that. Um, I also even remember I, I talked to the first woman born in the U.S. from IVF, um, Elizabeth, and um, she remembered coming across Miriam Mankin as just like liter- like a literal footnote in the other scientist story, and she was like shocked when she learned about what she'd done. But I don't know, I guess her full story remains to be told, but I'm confident that it will. Yeah. I'd love to for you to share your insights on your journey about this, but the one thing that I highlighted, and again, I think it was in the footnotes. You had some really cool footnotes, by the way. They oh. were really funny. <laughs> They were a way for me to blow off steam when I was getting pissed. I, I, yeah, I kind of got that sense. I was like, she she wanted to make sure we got that, but it didn't be <laughs> part of the book. I loved it. I mean, it was great. Um, so puberty blockers are an emerging treatment for children. I was like, what? <laughs> Do you remember this yeah. footnote about the puberty blockers? Oh, yeah, there's, there's a huge discussion about this. So this is um, for trans or non-binary kids. Um, there's a big discussion about what, what age it's appropriate to use puberty blockers, which are a way of delaying puberty generally until someone knows what gender puberty, what what path they want to follow. Um, yeah, there are a lot of issues at play, like the idea of medical consent, you know, um, is, there, is there an age where you can make that decision? Um, and just the unknowns about what they'll do long term, which is like data we really need to be getting, but it's, I would say getting that data is, is being stymied by the politics surrounding trans health care, um, which right. is super unfortunate. Uh, but yeah, it is, it is something that any pediatrician who works with trans kids is aware of now um, and thinking about. Okay. Well, at least there's awareness. So with, for your journey around the ovaries, what were some interesting things that you found that you didn't expect? Oh man, yeah, the ovaries are so cool. The action going on in the ovary just struck me as so much more dynamic and violent than anything that I had been taught. I always thought that they just hung around and they, I don't know, were kind of like bubble wrap and one of these little pods burst open and an egg came out every month. But no, it's like some hormonal... uh, uh, signals tell a whole cohort of eggs to start growing rapidly at some point in the month and they like outcompete each other and when one gets the edge it inhibits all the others and they just die and the one that's growing grows like huge it's like bulging off the ovary and it explodes letting out all these hormones and fluid and that egg has to find its way through the pelvic cavity to the fallopian tubes which suck it up and like it was just such a like adventurous story that I was shocked that we'd all heard the journey of the courageous sperm swimming to the egg. But we never heard what the egg endured to get to that point. That was really cool to think about and reframe. I had a lot of fun learning about the first scientist to see an egg and sperm fuse um, in vivo, so the opposite of what Miriam Mencken was doing, like in a creature. Um, actually, in this case, it wasn't in a creature. It was sea urchins, and they actually have external fluid, so they both just like spew out a cloud of uh, sperm and eggs, and they find each other and fuse, and they're very convenient because they're all transparent, so you can see that happening. Um, and there were just some very eccentric scientists who were equally enthralled as Miriam Mencken in the beauty of this sea urchin jizz and ovarian fluid happening. Seeing that happen, that fusion, and the fact that it was not the sperm penetrating the egg solely um, helped make it clear that fertilization and conception is a two-way street and that both um, both halves play an equal part in it. And, and later we found out they play an equal part in how much DNA they contribute. So it was a really important step um, in wow. giving females their due. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, and by the way, speaking of fertility, like they're just realizing, or not not just, but it's becoming much more um, in the press and public around that, you know, infertility, for example, is not just the woman. It's, you know, oh, <laughs> it, yeah. it can be both. And, 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 and sadly, like the men aren't always evaluated. I mean, I feel lucky yeah, because right. um, I always wonder if this was a good or bad thing, but my OBGYN was very proactive and she had done some testing and she referred me to a fertility doctor right away. So I didn't even have like that trying period. And, um, and she uh, sent me away. And so right away I had had 
a situation where the sperm and egg, everything was being tested. So we never had that delay of, oh, well, it's definitely not the, you know, could never be the, the male. And, Always you know, fault. you can be on this for your journey. So we had we had both the whole time. Yeah, that is a really interesting consequence of this, like, you know, I always talk about the lack of knowledge about the female body, but part of the consequence is that um, we end up not knowing much about sperm and male fertility because we've always assumed that it was fine. So all we do with sperm is basically count it and see if it's moving around, but we're not very sophisticated about analyzing it um, because of some of these assumptions. So everyone gets hurt by this, basically. And there's a really good book called Gynecology, G-U-Y, by a sociologist Renee Almeling that goes into why there's not a male gynecology branch, why it ended up being urology and female bodies got medicalized because they were assumed to be the cause of all fertility issues. Regeneration, the uterus. Dr. Linda Griffiths, she had cancer mm -hmm. and endometriosis. Right. Yeah. And it's so sad and unfortunate, but it's almost as if having that is what kind of helped her in her journey. So tell us that story. Yeah, I do think she was really uniquely positioned to see endometriosis and tackle it differently than anyone before. Um, so, you know, her background was totally different. She was a bioengineer at MIT in the 90s. She made this like ear mouse, which was they, they grew an ear scaffolding on a mouse and it's in all these bio biology textbooks. And I remember seeing it as a kid. So but she was really good at growing like using living cells to grow various architecture. And at the same time, she'd had this entire, I mean, adult life, I mean, since she got her first period of having really debilitating endometriosis and having to work around that and in general push through it um, and getting no real help from doctors. You know, she was told that it was psychological. One doctor amazingly told her that she must be rejecting her femininity and that's what was going on. There was also the suggestion that you should just get pregnant. Um, so just crazy stuff and also really difficult to explain in like a male dominated environment like tech, like MIT where she was working. So she really struggled with that silently for a long time. And it was only once she had this career and she saw that her niece was struggling with the same disease that she had 20 years before and that nothing had changed that she was like all right like i need to see what i can do with the skills i have to address this and it turned out that she she had the unique skills to be able to create in her case like uterus organoids so they're like uh, like little proto like um like cells that are scaffolded that work like the endometrial lining and respond to hormones and so you can test hormones on them and see how they react differently than like normal endometrial lining um, and you could test drugs on them. So she combined her experience as a patient and as a bioengineer and created a whole center um, to study endo and, um, and other menstrual disorders. It's amazing. It is amazing. Is she still active, I oh, assume? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, she still runs that center um, and they collaborate with like what we we're talking about diagnostics and how you need a treatment plan too. I think that in endo, in endo they're really aware of that and she works with people that do diagnostics and do other parts um, okay. of the pipeline. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, it's um, what really resonated. There's a quote in there. Um, she said, to have someone tell me something's wrong with me, it was a huge relief. Yeah. That the uncertainty, the anxiety and the blaming yourself, like all of that is so much worse um, and getting a name is so important and, and like credibility and legitimacy to what you're going through. So before we get into beauty, the neo-vagina, mm -hmm. I had a couple of questions. So one is Freud. Mm. Can you can you just summarize for us um, the impact of Freud? <laughs> oh, my God, that's a lot. I think for the purposes of what we're talking about, maybe two major things. Mm -hmm. um, one, he really mess things up for the clitoris and those of us who have them. So at some point he was, he was very confused about female sexuality and how a normal female woman develops um, from a girl. And eventually the theory he came up with was that 
humans are kind of born bisexual. They have like this potential to feel masculine or feminine in their sexuality. And that the clitoris is this vestige of masculinity. That little girls, they know it feels good and they touch themselves. But at some magical point, they have to give up their phallus, as he called it, and accept the fact that they were born a woman, which is defined as a creature without a penis, quote, um, and transfer their orgasm and their pleasure from their clitoris to their vagina. Um, And this was wildly out there. This was not a medical doctor, just a psychoanalyst who had this crazy idea, and I would say it resonated in gynecology and medicine forever and ever and ever. Um, So that had a big effect. Um, The other one was his conception and popularization of hysteria, which was a concept that had sort of been dying for a while, and he ended up working with a um, a a French neurologist who really believed in hysteria and taking this idea and running with it. So the old idea of hysteria was that it was like your uterus um, wandering around your body in search of sex and motherhood and causing trouble. And Freud kind of switched it and he said, there are times when people are having like neurotic um, symptoms or cramps and pain and menstrual issues or a hysteric pregnancy as he has described. And what's really at the root of it is psychological conflict, not an actual disease. Um, and so I, I find that really profound because if you talk to people that have endometriosis or fibroids or other menstrual disorders, almost inevitably the first thing a doctor suggests is that they go to a therapist and they get antidepressants. And so, so exactly, I'm sure you know, like so many women and people with uteruses are just shunted to the psychological path, which really dismisses their real medical symptoms. And for sure, you need mental health support often and both can impact each other. Um, But the effect is generally like, oh, honey, it's all in your head. Um, We can't help you over here in medicine. Why don't you go try therapy? And it's also people who have vulvodynia, vulval pain, face this all the time. Um, So those are the two big beefs I have with Freud. Yeah, I think it's a, a, a beautiful summary. And with the hysteria piece, you know, it was only removed as a diagnosis in 1980, I think it was. Right, like, that's right. Like, and crazy, I would say right? like kind of, it still lingers. It's like the oh, ghost yeah. and all these, like when someone says you have a psychosomatic disorder yeah. and they're like, yeah, dismissing it as neurosis essentially. <laughs> so before we get into the, the you know, vagina, I also want to say this one thing, which is, you know, you introduced yourself as a, a scientific writer. And I would say this was such a beautifully written, like the way you wrote it, it wasn't, so I, I want people to read the book because we're just going through some snippets just so you get an idea of some of the stories and hopefully just helps women um, or anyone who's listening actually to um, just identify with different aspects of the things we're talking about. So this was really just a highlight to encourage people to read. And it was just, so it's not a science, um, it is scientific, but it's, just a beautiful book. So I just want to compliment you on how you did it because it was a true journey. I'm like, I wish I could write like that. Mine would be like bullet points and like, here's the summary of the thing. And <laughs> there's a place for all the things. Yes. That's really kind. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Okay. So um, I loved this chapter because you, you spend the book talking about the different aspects of um, a woman's body, but then you talk about the transgender population and, um, what I thought was so interesting is just how different surgeons are approaching when an individual would like to transition. And it was interesting because I think there's, it says here, almost every surgeon does this procedure differently. Some focus more on the aesthetics, but some on pleasure. But to quickly summarize, um, you had shared that there are surgeons who fully get that the anatomy looks different, but what they actually do are similar. And so they're able to reconstruct it so that regardless of the gender you identify as, it's your body parts still work. So that's yeah. my um, non-writer's way of saying it. So so please add to that because you were the one doing these interviews. And I just thought it was it was such a neat chapter to read. No, that, that's a great theme to draw out. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, for me, it made a lot of sense to end on this chapter. It just pulled so many threads together. I think some people from England had questions, but they have different beliefs than I do. So basically, it was like the history of how gender affirmation surgery for trans women and specifically like body surgery or bottom surgery came about. And like much in the previous chapters are like what medicine and the larger society thought a woman should be and how it kind of tried to force her into this box and it had this, this these medical harms and consequences that came from that and the story of gender affirmation surgery is similarly like this is what makes a woman and in this case it's the ability to be penetrated by a man and to disappear into society and have a heterosexual partnership and be extra feminine and the very first surgeries like that was the goal which is a complete 180 from now where the focus is on you as an individual the experience you want and what you want to get out of your body or your new body parts however you think of it but do you want to experience sexual pleasure what do you want it to look like and instead of the doctor telling you this is what you need to look like this is what a woman should be and that was fascinating to me um, and yes and the other point as you were saying is that this surgery like it's only possible because our bodies are all so much more the same than different and I do bring up a few times how genitals like male and female genitals are often called opposites um, and so irreconcilably different and they have all the exact same parts they have the exact same erectile tissues and the same kind of nerves and even the same basic shape it's just that one is more internal and a little more spread out than the other one so yeah so the doctors that know that have worked with all genders are the ones that understand this and that are basically using the same body parts to craft a, a new vulva or vagina um, and I, yeah, I thought that was really cool um, because it's saying these are not two ends of a very different spectrum. These are two things that are very similar and we can work with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the stories were really, really cool. And I do encourage, again, people to, to read them. I want to end with this quote that you actually had at the end of your book. So you mentioned from the moment you open this book, you knew you weren't going to get an answer to the question of what makes a woman. We are still exploring the female body. We are still defining it and then rewriting and expanding that definition as we go. The boundaries are fuzzier than ever. And if science has anything to say about gender, it is that we are more alike than we are different. I love that. Thank you. Yeah, I think that, that sums it up for me. <laughs> it's an exciting new world out there. And like all the science that was in its genesis when I was writing this is now like really... Um, proceeding in leaps and bounds and it's really exciting to watch like you know the future of fertility technology who knows and just to me it's actually exciting purely to understand the basic biology of the uterus and menstruation and the ovaries and the clitoris like the basic mapping um, I'm excited yep. for us to have that yeah well it's just I mean I hate to use this but it's the first thing that popped into my head it's like you know, these athletes, you know, they're superstars because they do the basics over and over and over again to get good at them to then do the unique things. And so. And we haven't done that. Yeah, we haven't done the baseline stuff. We're promising like crazy future stuff like ovarian rejuvenation. And we just need to like map this territory. So um, I have one other question and I want and then I want to ask you how people should stay in touch. The book reviews. Were you blown away by how many people read and reviewed this book? I mean, thousands yeah, no, I, I am blown away. It's just validating that what people saw in it and that people found it empowering, found it relevant to their own journey or got excited about looking at science more. And the fact that I talked to like doctors and medical students as well as a lot of like patient activists um, and and podcast hosts like yourself that like just so many different types of people that found their own thing in it that makes me really happy because I like writing this book I was concerned I was doing a lot like I was trying to get science science history uh, stories of women from like historic archives um, and I was talking like I was ended up talking about gender and feminism as well and, and gender bias so there's a lot going on so I'm just really glad that people found some something meaningful and helpful in it that's awesome so how do people stay in touch and follow your work 
please um, follow me, well, at the site formerly known as Twitter, but I'll still have the same handle at the other sites. It's at Rachel E. Gross, R-A-C-H-E-L-E-G-R-O-S-S. My Instagram is um, gross underscore out, gross out. Um, and all of my recent work should be on my website at rachelegross.com. So pretty awesome. easy. Yeah, and feel free to drop me a line. Thank you for everything you've done and continue to do. I'm glad that, I mean, it's always unfortunate we go through these terrible journeys, but it's great when we are able to make something out of it. And, you know, just seeing not just your book, but all the writing that you have done um, and awareness creating. Um, I'm really excited about it and can't wait to keep following and see what's next. Same here. I'm so glad. This is a great conversation. And that wraps up another empowering session here at the FemPower Health Podcast. Now, before you dash off, I've got a quick, exciting invitation for you. Please join our vibrant community by subscribing to our weekly newsletter, because it's really your frontline update on groundbreaking women's health research, the latest health-enhancing products, fun quizzes to boost your health IQ, and unique discoveries that you won't want to miss. All of this delivered straight to your inbox, cutting through the noise of social media algorithms. Love today's insights? Show your support by rating and reviewing our podcast. Your feedback is more than just a pat on our backs here at FemPower Health. It lights the way for others seeking guidance and community in their health journey, amplifying the voices that need to be heard. And for a deeper dive into today's topics, check out the show notes and explore our website at fempower-health.com. Our site is a treasure trove of knowledge, neatly categorized by topics of interest and life stages, ensuring you find exactly what you need to empower your health journey. And your voice matters to us deeply. Whether you have a question, a story to share, or feedback on our episodes, reach out directly at info at fempower-health.com, drop us a message on social media, or hit reply on any newsletter. Your insights inspire our conversations. And a quick note, the knowledge we share is here to embolden you in discussions with your healthcare provider. It's not medical advice. Always consult with your doctor for health decisions. And remember, the diverse perspectives of our guests reflect their individual journeys, and it's not an endorsement by FemPower Health. Here's to empowering your health journey one episode at a time, and I'll see you on the next FemPower Health podcast episode.